I can't sleep when I lay in bed Too much thinking in my head I don't know what to do anymore But come on now, tell me the score I'm a victim of circumstance I never really had a chance I lay down and stare at my feet You know the world has got me beat Welcome to today's edition of Mental Health Matters. Today we're going to be talking about living in recovery. we got a great show ahead for, uh, for everyone. Stay tuned. Welcome to our show, Dr. Rodriguez. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. And thank you for taking time out to come to our show. So let's start by uh, kind of tell me a little bit about yourself and why did you actually get into the field um, that you're uh, particularly in? That's like the question of the year. <laughs> <laughs> actually, um, driving here was quite the experience. I was actually thinking about the very question you just asked <laughs> because um, as of the 16th of this month, 25 years prior, I used to walk up and down this street in Stockton Boulevard day and night. Mm -hmm. uh, what got me into the field was my very own uh, experience um, uh, being addicted to um, illicit substances, drugs, alcohol, and um, for about six years, from 1986 to February 16th of 1992, mm -hmm. I walked out of an extremely successful life that externally looked like someone who had everything and there was no reason for me to be unhappy, uh, to want to do anything but continue to do what I was doing uh, with my career. But unfortunately, I had a lot of unresolved that began as a child Mm -hmm. And I lived with um, a great deal of trauma. Mm -hmm. It was very difficult to regulate my emotions. I found it really difficult to uh, have attachment, closeness to people. Actually, I would ab absolutely uh, sabotage and or undermine any type of healthy relationship. So to roll the tape up, uh, March 9th of 1991, after I had hit a physical bottom, and went from living in uh, the governor's estate at 251 Perkins Street in the Oakland Hills, mm -hmm. uh, I found myself um, in a 90-day blackout in Southern California, and I spiraled to uh, a place where I just couldn't manage the addiction. My addiction was crack, cocaine, mm -hmm. and uh, I also smoked heroin, mm -hmm. and I drank. Um, I was an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. And I walked away from one life and became addicted to a uh, homeless lifestyle. Mm -hmm. So it, March 9th in 1991, I was doing my usual, uh, not sleeping for days at a time due to the drug use or drug seeking behavior. Uh, I was walking down uh, a road in Oakland, California, looking for the after hours liquor at three in the morning and a car came around the curb pulled up to where I was walking, and I heard a voice say, hey lady, and out of the rear window came a hand, and I got shot in the heart, uh, and I literally died. I remembered um, just one point in the, in the ambulance um, where one of the attendants uh, was looking at me, and I remembered hearing myself say, am I gonna die? I had already, uh, had to be resuscitated. And I'll never forget this young man's face. He, he was weeping and he said no. The next time I woke up was in the hospital in the midst of a near death. I was in the corner and the presence of God was all around me. And I could see myself with a sheet over my face and 
I could see my mother and grandmother who were weeping, which they had done a lot of during my addiction, you know, being missing for months at a time. One time I was missing for an entire year. And I remember, I'm not going to really get into that experience. The one thing I had to share with you is I, I more felt than heard a voice say, you still have work to do. And in that moment, the machine came back on and my heart began to beat and I heard my mother yell that. Uh, I was alive and the nurse came in. I'll let you know that because addiction is such a difficult thing, it's not a social issue, it's not a moral issue, it's not a criminal issue, it's a disease of the brain. It's mm -hmm. a brain problem. And I can tell you that being shot in the heart, going through what I did and what doctors did to make sure that I could be alive and was told I had a year to live. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't enough for me to arrest the addiction. I couldn't do it. I had already been to treatment, 13 treatment facilities, including Delancey Street in San Francisco, which is one of the best. And uh, after I got out of a, uh, a residential uh, respite, um, I had a lawyer who met me and filed for victims of crime, and so I had a check very quickly. Mm -hmm. That $2,500 check was gone within less than a week, and I was having two strokes back to back in crack houses in Oakland, continuing to smoke crack and heroin. So I'll roll the tape up. My family thought it'd be great to get me to Sacramento. I came to Sacramento. Uh, by threat and force with a baseball bat. <laughs> and I actually went to a treatment program right here off Stockton Boulevard, 4049 Miller Way. It's mm -hmm. called Gateway House for Women. Mm -hmm. Gateway House for, for Women uh, actually gave me an invitation to leave not long after I got there because of my uh, behavior. Mm -hmm. My behavior was egregious. It was very difficult to be around me. Um, I went back out in my addiction, I remained homeless. I lived under an overpass at, by Loaves and Fishes. I pushed a cart, I lived at the river. Every day was about uh, doing what I needed to do to be high and not have to deal with a lot of the emotional pain and the inability to regulate that emotional pain uh, moment to moment. I'll tell you that at five months pregnant with two twins, I was still in the streets, and a wonderful, i they called them a nun, Sister Nora Lowe and Lowe's and Fishes, became very passionate about my plight. Mm. And um, she was a phenomenal human being and got me into a mother-infant home uh, called Bishop Gallegos downtown. And through her and her efforts, and probably a mustard seed of faith I had, not even knowing it. Yeah. I uh, went into a two-year residential treatment program for mothers and children, and uh, I just celebrated 25 years of continuous sobriety on the 16th of February. That's awesome. Uh, my girls uh, are phenomenal. They mm -hmm. both just finished junior college. Yeah. Um, thank God uh, I had all of the people that were in my life in treatment and aftercare that helped me understand the importance of children, babies, being exposed in utero, especially to crack cocaine and heroin, and what it took and what it would take for me to engage with those two little babies in order for them not to become victims of uh, adverse childhood experiences in yeah. the way I see daily, even in some of the adults that I treat. Yeah, so let, let me ask you a question. How, how did you get introduced to that, that particular lifestyle? Well, <clears throat> uh, my father was an alcoholic. Okay. My mother was a prescription uh, addict. She was a wine bibber. Mm -hmm. I uh, was raised with a tremendous amount of abuse and ended up in the foster care system at 12 years old. And it was all around me. Uh, I believe in my later years, uh, like my late 20s, I became very success successful in Los Angeles, California, and had friends who were very well known in the entertainment industry, and the thing to do uh, was to freebase cocaine. That, yeah. that was what was going on in the late 70s, 
and then uh, I eventually uh, transitioned to Oakland, California, and one day, free-based cocaine wasn't available, and I uh, happened to be introduced to crack. Yeah. And it just took me to a place where I couldn't recover. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I know you have several doctorate degrees, and so I want to kind of talk a little bit about that. At what point in your life did you were you able to go and get your um, get you know some form of education? Um, because I, I, was it during the time that you was going through your um, drug use, or was it afterwards? Or so I'm trying to figure out like when did you when were you able to do that? Well, I never did go to college until after I got uh, sober. Oh, okay. And uh, as a result of all the support system that I had. Uh, and wanting to be an alcohol and drug counselor. Um, in 1994, I registered at Sacramento City College and attended their uh, chemical dependency program and then transferred to American River and completed my chemical dependency uh, program uh, with them and got my AA. Mm -hmm. And while I was in my second year, I was in an AA meeting. I lived in AA meetings. I was so afraid I would go out and drink or use, yeah. I met a man who said, I love your story. Have you ever buy, thought about going to college? Mm. And I was pretty proud of myself being in junior college. I said, I am. I, I'm in junior college. I was in American River at that time. Yeah. He said, no, that's a junior college. I mean a state college. And really, I didn't really know what he was referring to. Mm -hmm. I know my response was, I probably wouldn't get through it because I need a lot of help. It was mm -hmm. very difficult for me to to study, to take notes, to mm -hmm. remember things. Although I did well, I got straight A's at Sacramento City College in American River, I just couldn't fathom uh, being able to do the things that he shared. Yeah. And he reached for his wallet and he took out his business card and he handed it to me and he happened to be the director of admissions at Sac State. Wow. I did follow up with him and uh, was admitted to Sac State and got all services available through students with disability. And within a couple of years, I actually was accepted into the McNair Scholars Program, mm. completed that, got my, earned my first doctorate in the field of psychology, uh, September 11th of 2004, and continued and earned a second doctorate in December of 2008. That's, that is awesome. Thank you. So since then, um, you've been doing incredible work in a community. So I want to talk a little bit about that. I know um, that you're involved with Gateway Weight Corps, uh, on-site strategies and gateway uh, interventions. Can I, let's talk a little bit about these programs and your involvement in them. Okay. I uh, was really led to do something different than traditional uh, addiction treatment because the traditional addiction treatment didn't help me maintain my sobriety. Mm. It was a lot of the more alternative medicine or holistic work that really helped me heal. Mm. I mean, I couldn't begin to self-regulate uh, or deal with the insecure attachment until I could stabilize. And that happened through th things that are referred to as mindfulness, creative arts, different type of things, but were done in a very therapeutic way. Yes. It's what, uh, that's all I could get at that time, which is 25 years ago. So I founded Gateway Corp. And although we are a nonprofit and public charity, Corp stands for Center on Restoring Purpose. Whose purpose? The client's purpose. Awesome. And that they're to really believe that they're entitled to an extraordinary life. So when someone comes in and they're using, and they come into Gateway Corp, there's an agreement that after today, you won't use anymore through our intensive outpatient program. And I have to admit, mm. most of them don't. Most of them have a very long-term successful outcome working with our office. Uh, we are not a medical model program. We are a public health program. Okay. We are not interested in, in uh, meeting the criteria for the insurance to get paid. Mm -hmm. to get involved with the political pieces that go on around addiction treatment. Our commitment is that that person in front of us receives best practices for exactly what they need in ways that are effective. That's awesome. Thank you. Awesome. I, I know when I spoke with you, um, you talked about um, after getting the client the 
uh, help that they need. You guys also provide services to the family members. Absolutely. S let's talk a little bit about that piece. Well, traditionally what happens is families want to uh, uh, place their, their loved ones in treatment mm -hmm. and then they want to go about their life. Uh -huh. The difficulty is and through my experience, and I have been uh, treating substance abuse now for 22 years, I got my first position at three years clean, is that when the addict goes through treatment, if the family is not also doing their own work, mm -hmm. the addict comes back substance free with right now minimal treatment because they're 30, 60, 90 day programs, which I call a spin drive program. Yeah. They really don't have the length of sobriety or the skill sets that would really be a, a, a support system for them to develop the knowledge and the skills they need to go back into the disconnected, dysfunctional family system and survive it. Yeah. yeah. What happens is they begin to use again because they can't function within that same system. Exactly. So about, uh, let's see, it's 2000 and, um, 17. So almost five years ago, um, actually five years ago, I went to a training that was offered by a woman who is an international, probably the best interventionist in the world named wow. Dr. Judith Landau. I went to Malibu. I was trained as an interventionist. I actually am a certified Arise interventionist too, which is very new. Nice. I was also certified by the SIP, which is the uh, Pennsylvania Board of Certification that certifies nationally. Yeah. And I opened my own intervention company, which is called Gateway Interventions. Okay. And what we do is we do an, the, immediate, the immediate initial family intervention. We actually work very closely with the family or, and or loved ones. Uh, it even could be a, a, an employer. Mm -hmm. It could be a sponsor that they may have had an AA. Anyone who could be significant to get the addict into treatment and actually potentially transport, then we meet with the family and we offer family system services, which we also in the West Coast here in California are the only ones that are actively training family system services and we endorse professionals in the field to do that same work. Our success ratio is phenomenal. That's awesome. Like this Wednesday, we have six family members coming in intergenerationally in, the, in their 70s, grandparents, parents in their 50s, young people in their 20s where, the, where there is an addiction, there's a threat of substance use disorder within that family system. When we're done, mm -hmm. it could be three hours, it could be four hours. The two individuals that are their primary focus will not only get the addiction treatment they need and the support system, which could be intensive outpatient or residential treatment, we will actively continue to work with the parents and the grandparents, which we have done for probably over five years, the same family, different family members that come up, they're using addiction, or they're using uh, uh, substances, and we address their addiction needs. Yeah. The ones that do come have experienced long-term uh, uh, sobriety. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and I think everything you said is important, you know, when you, I'll, I'll just, you know, talk about uh, my background a little bit. I come from a family where uh, drug and alcohol use was, was very um, uh, present, you right. know. Um, grandmother was alcoholic, mother was an alcoholic, aunt, uncles on drugs, sisters on drugs, and, you know, father, and, you know, it, it, was, it was there. And, you know, I've had my own uh, experience as well, you know. Um, but I, it was something in me that um, wanted better for myself, right. you know, if that makes sense. And, you know, even to this day, I have, um, you know, a lot of family members are still battling um, drug addiction and alcohol, you know, alcoholism and stuff. And, um, and now I'm finding that now their children are battling the same thing. And now their children, right. it's not getting introduced. Generation. Right, and, and, and it's just like, you know, and I've, I've spoke with, um, with certain people in, in my family and, you know, trying to really get them to understand like this, this is a problem because it's, right. it's being passed down from generation to generation. And it's like some people don't understand that I'm being looked at as somewhat the enemy because I won't, 
um, buy liquor and cigarettes and, you know, marijuana, whatever, whatever their, you know, choice of addiction is. And so, you know, I, I, that's a problem. And so I think it's important that, that family members do uh, get treated and educated as well. I have a friend who, uh, who just recently, um, you know, kind of got off, um, you know, opiates. You know, he, he's, you know. Epidemic problem. A major problem, and I and I I've, I've met him when I came down here to Sacramento, and I just and I looked at this boy maybe two or three months ago, and I'm like, wow, like you know, what's going on in your life is is mm -hmm. is tragic because some of the decisions that, that that he was making, he he couldn't go to work for five days straight. He was calling off two and three days a week. I mean, just some of the decisions that he was making was very unproductive for his life, right. and. And I, I felt bad for him uh, because he have he has a family member that he lived with that is also addicted to the same particular opiate pills that he was taking, and um, and so I remember him talking to me about it, and he was saying that it was hard for him to get off because the family member is 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 on it, and he feel like when a family member was going through withdrawals, he felt responsible for going out there in the street getting some pills and giving it to the family member, right. which was making it hard for him to get off. So I, I got a chance to sit down with, you know, his sisters and his dad and, you know, and some of them felt like he was making excuses. But I was thinking to myself, no, he's not making excuses. This is, this is how he feels. This is real for him. Right. You know, he can't get off because, it, it's, he can't get off because he's addicted. But the fact that when he tries to get off, then because this other person is present in the house, that's doing the same thing, it makes it much more difficult for him. So how, how important do you think it is for um, family members not to enable each other in their addiction? L let's talk about that a little bit. Well, you said some really uh, great things, uh, many of them very significant to um, how the family system um, exists. Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, uh, there are several things that keep a family sick. Addiction is a family disease. One is shame. Mm -hmm. Two is secrets. Mm -hmm. Three is codependency. Four is enabling. Five is enmeshment. Until you can address all of these areas within the family system, it's very difficult for the family to begin to move into a place of um, really recognizing it, admitting it, and being willing to do the work. Mm -hmm. uh, it's as if you are actu actually uh, moving into a place of offending them because what you're exactly. really doing is you're mm -hmm. penetrating a culture. Mm -hmm. It becomes a culture within that family system. Uh -huh. Relative to the opiates, there are so many um, an unfortunate um experience with alcohol mm -hmm. because you can buy it in the liquor store exactly two opiates because doctors love to prescribe it even when you don't need it exactly. and people also get into doctor shopping for the opiates exactly and usually a family member is not knowledgeable or aware that they can take the opiates and give them daily mm -hmm. of what they need yeah the other piece is the new marijuana piece uh -huh. because it's not legal all three of those is absolutely epidemic. Why? Mm. Because it's legal. Exactly. Because it's accessible. Oh, so I'm glad you brought that up because I mean, we, we, we're, we're talking about some things that's gonna really help my, my friend's family. Right. Now he's, um, he somewhat got off the opiates, but now the medicinal marijuana is now his so-called drug of choice. Right. And I, I just had a conversation with him over the weekend about this and I was explaining to him that, you know, just because it's legalized doesn't necessarily mean that it's okay. You know, Correct. because now what's going on, he's taking it throughout the day. And you know, I, I know what it's like to smoke marijuana. I used to be a marijuana smoker. Right. And I know that, um, you know, it, it gets you really lethargic. You're really lazy, you're relaxed. You're not as motivated as you would normally be. You're absolutely correct. And so he calls, now, now he, he, he'll, he'll call in sometimes and he, he say, oh, you know, Jay, I, I'm tired in the morning. And I'm like, well, it's because of the, this marijuana you're taking. <laughs> You know, he, he's not putting, putting this, these pieces together. Correct. And you know, so I, I think you're on a sum with that because, because it's legalized now. Now you find more people 
flopping to this because it's legalizing and they say no it's okay Correct. but you know it also opens up the door for other gateway drugs as well True. you know so um, i'm hoping that somebody you know can watch this program and, and really get something from what you're saying because um it, it's 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 important i am a um uh, one of the 12 core leaders that was flown back to uh, Oregon uh, March of last year by Betty Ford Hazelton. There are about 25 of us who are trained in MAT opiate treatment. Hmm. And I believe in treating the opiate, uh, the addiction to opiates with medica medication assisted treatment and a 12 step program is probably one of the most powerful and effective ways to treat that particular addiction. We do have several mm -hmm. opiate treatment programs, especially Dr. Stenson's program that's uh, here in Sacramento that's been around forever, which is Cora Medical, and they'll provide the opiate uh, treatment, the medication-assisted medication, m medication -assisted treatment at no cost, even takes Medi-Cal. Yeah. A lot of people aren't aware of that. You can go right there and get a dose every day or enough for a period of time that you can continue to be engaged in your life yeah and and have some long-term sobriety yeah but the the difficulty is it's a very difficult addiction yeah to rather arrest there's something else else you said and then you said gateway drugs and that was cigarettes mm -hmm. when i got clean it was important that i stop using the illicit drugs mm -hmm. the alcohol and smoking mm -hmm. but what i find is one of the uh uh, other epidemic problems we have is cigarette smoking, especially with older adults. Mm -hmm. It is high in death rate. And for people who get clean from alcohol and or drugs, if they continue smoking, it basically is still an addiction within itself and is very much a gateway drug back into using again. Exactly. So we really work uh, diligently in uh, educating our clients and encouraging them to uh, stop smoking. And we provide everything at no cost for the individual to support them in that process. I believe cigarette smoking is one of the harder addictions to to uh, to address and, I, to, and to get clean from. I have to agree, because right. I used to smoke um, Newport Shore. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it was very difficult for me to right. stop. I mean, right. yeah, I have definitely agree right. uh, with that. So I'm, I'm grateful that, you know, that habit is gone, but it, it, it was that really difficult for me to um, to kick that habit, so to speak. I, I want to ask you, wh what is the relationship between addiction and mental health? Because I, I want to kind of talk about that. Um, you know, how is a person mental health uh, when they're on, um, you know, substance abuse, you know, when, when, when they're abusing drugs or ha however you well, want to stage it? First of all, I want to clarify that addiction is a substance use disorder and mm. it is a mental health issue okay. and it is in the DSM-5 which is the current diagnostic manual. What happens many times is that it's the mental health disorders that are not treated or even identified that really um, are the predictor of people be, you know, moving into um, use. Yeah. You know, uh, The other piece is I've been really actively speaking uh, about adverse childhood experiences. And it's very clear that, like a lot of my generation, your generation, the millennials today that have uh, endured any type of domestic violence, whether mental, emotional, physical, spiritual, whether it's yelling, whether it's a divorce, whether it's a separation, develop mental health disorders, pr particularly substance use, yeah. uh, the inability to form uh, healthy relationships. Mm -hmm. And I really hope that more people in the field begin to become self-educated or attend trainings or presentations about adverse childhood experiences called ACEs. And I believe it will give us even a more effective outcome with the population that we're treating. Yeah. You had also asked me about on-site strategies. I'd like to be able to just give you a little bit of information. Years ago, I was hired as a consultant to look at the current certifying agencies and the impact with the Affordable Care Act. And what I found was 
at least over half of the individuals that have been certified as addiction counselors were expired in the registries. Mm -hmm. And I did a sampling, a random sampling, to identify why they went to school, they paid all of these funds to become a substance use counselor, paid to become certified, and then no longer had their certification. What I found is many of them couldn't afford the CEU trainings mm -hmm. that were required to renew, and they also couldn't afford the renewal fees. Okay. So five years ago, we opened Onsite Strategies, and Onsite Strategies is a leading professional development hub that provides CEU trainings, workshops, and conferences. And for people who want to renew their certification, who want to work in the field and cannot afford it, we provide them free CEU trainings and we will sponsor the renewal fee if they qualify, if they're not working, if they have a lot of financial challenges, if they're in the middle of a separation, have high uh, child support bills, whatever it is, we look at those individuals, but we support people back into the field. That's, I mean, I think that's really, really awesome. Thank you. Uh, because we do need more uh, people working in this field because, it, I mean, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a major problem right. and it has been a major problem for, for years. You know, you kind of talked about, um, you know, when a person is um, using a form of, you know, maybe it's opiate or, or some other drug of choice, right. that they do develop some form of mental uh, health um, issues. I know my friend, he was depressed all the time. Mm -hmm. He had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, anxiety. Um, he was, um, had thoughts of suicide and, and you know, and I didn't, never shared this with him. But I was very, very concerned about him uh, committing suicide. You know, um, he, you know, the the word he would use was OJ. I'm battling the down feeling. He didn't want to, he didn't want to use depression, um, or he didn't want to use the word suicide when he would probably say, "Well, think about right. um, doing some, you know, to myself." You know, it was. I mean, it was. I mean, this. I mean, I can't even describe how concerned I was for him. You know. And, you know, I will, uh, you know, connect, you know, with his sisters and, you know, just, um, you know, through text messages and, and things like that. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm glad now he's moving into a better place. But right now I'm trying to work with him on getting rid of this, this marijuana thing because now in his mind it's okay because it's now legal. Right. But, he, you know, I don't think he really realized just what he just walked out of, so to speak. Correct. And that door is still open. Hmm. That door is definitely still open, in, in, in my opinion. Um, um, so do you believe the biggest factor that contributes to mental health and behavioral health issues um, in our society is, is, is kind of linked um, through a lack of quality, quality relationships? Because I, I'll, absolutely, and, I, and the reason I'm asking you that because you know I think part of the reason um, I kind of went down a wrong path or made poor choices in life was because I, I've always felt like I didn't have that good relationship with my family. You know, and I, and I yes. talk about that a lot on the show because I know I'm not the only one, and it's not to make myself you know, sit high and them sit low. I mean, it, 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 it is what it is, you know. Uh, um, my mother, you know, she was an alcoholic and I, I remember how, you know, when I graduated from, from eighth grade, nobody was at the graduation. Whoa. And I remember graduating from high school, nobody was at the graduation. And mm -hmm. so during that time, I started to develop this, this mentality as, you know, it's about me, myself and I, you right. know, because I felt like, if my family don't love me or if I didn't feel the love coming from it, from them, then nobody else will. And so I, and I think that kind of spiraled me out of control in a little bit when I started, you know, drinking and doing marijuana and things like that, because I felt like, you know, nobody loved and cared about me, right. you know, and I always would gravitate towards my friends, you know, and right. so when I didn't get the 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 love or the um, what I felt I should have got from my family member it was like okay cool you know let me right. go back to drinking and doing the right. things that I was doing so do you think th there's some correlation there when you don't have a quality relationship in your life do you think people are most likely to go down that path absolutely I uh, was trained and supervised by a theorist named Dr William Glasser that's like a Maslow a Jung and um, 
he came from a public health model. Mm. And there's something that we took away from that experience. Uh, I met with him on a regular basis. I would fly down south and was certified nationally and internationally as a choice theorist years ago. And what we learned was one thing that contributes to a large percent of mental health issues is a lack of quality relationships. Mm -hmm. And as a professional practitioner, clinician, doctor in the field, one of the most significant things that I believe needs to happen between a client and or patient and the therapist or the doctor is, a, is an attunement, a very mm -hmm. powerful relationship between those two individuals. And what happens when you have that is you see far more successful outcomes than uh, a, a client and or patient and a therapist or doctor who work together and there is no relationship. Mm. And I believe too, in our families, one of the most important things we could do was Mother Teresa who said that, is if we wanna help people recover and have an amazing life, basically, is to start with our own family. Mm -hmm. And although it can be difficult, it can happen. And I'm just gonna put it out there, we are one of the most phenomenal family systems trainers in the nation that's awesome. and we have it available for people who are licensed people who are certified family members clergy and i really suggest that for anyone who really wants to begin to identify what is undermining that dysfunctional and disconnected family system mm -hmm. is to come to the training become educated get the skill sets you can also make an appointment with our office to work with your family members who are willing, and we can also train you and give you the skills to hopefully encourage those who don't want to participate to eventually engage. That's, that's, that's awesome. Okay. Uh, so when a loved one, and you may have talked about this a little earlier today, but when a loved one is go through treatment, why is it important for the family member to be a part of that, that, that treatment. Because sometimes family members feel like, okay, look, you know, you, you're in a rehab now, you're getting your treatment. And so that's all we want to do is get you the help you need. We're fine. We're okay. But why is it, is it important that they also be a part of that, uh, that, that treatment system as well? Because addiction is a family disease. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, everyone's playing a part. Mm -hmm. I'd like to just give you a very quick example. Let's just say you have a two-parent family and there are, uh, there is a, um, an identified addict and mm -hmm. there are other family members in that household. If everyone in that household is focusing on the addict, mm -hmm. then what do you think is going on with the other individuals in the house? Exactly. They aren't focusing on what they need to do for themselves. Exactly. And once that addict is out of the house, then it leaves them all to look at each other. Exactly. So in many households, unfortunately, when that addict comes home and if that family isn't doing their own work, they literally almost set that person back up to relapse, to fail. Yeah. Because they need to focus on that person. That is a part of the system they've developed and created. Yeah. And unfortunately, again, most don't recognize it. Mm -hmm. The other piece is the secrets, the shaming, the codependency, the enabling, the enmeshment. All of that is like the glue that keeps it all together exactly. in a very, uh, dis I would say, undermining way. The family mm -hmm. is just not a healthy family system. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You know, this, and I, oh, I, I know I'm probably going to get in trouble mm -hmm. by them, but I, I have to say this anyway. Uh, well, I will say this first that I, I, I love these people dearly, the sisters, my friend, the mother and father, you know, they have really welcomed me into their family as, as their own. And I, I really mean that, you know, you know, Christmas, you know, last year Christmas came, you know, I got gifts, you know, um, over for, for, for dinner with the family. And, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm really close to them, but I've noticed through conversation with um, my friend uh, that the father, I, I have been doing a lot of praying for the father specifically. Um, you know, I know, I know because of what is going on within within the household 
I know that he's greatly impacted by that. Correct. And so now, you know, um, and I hope I'm telling this right, he um, is like going out and doing like not only his regular work, but a lot of side jobs and stuff. Right. So he he's removing himself out of the house because right. he can't control what's going on. He don't really fully understand what's going on. Right. And, you know, and it's like, you know, he's finding himself being very upset, angry, because he... That's normal in yeah. this type of family system. Though. Yeah. And so I, I just, you know, I want you to kind of speak about that to them because, you know, when you when you got got a situation like that going on, I mean, you know, I mean, he brought his, he raised his children up, you know, in church, you know, really good, good man, you know, uh, worked hard for his family, wife didn't have to work, he was a provider. And for something like that to hit your household, you know, it was mm -hmm. devastating to him. Well, he'd be the perfect candidate to come and work with our, our office. Yeah. He would. Um, I'm wondering if it would be okay for you to mention how people can contact us in the event they need any services. Yeah, well, uh, what we're going to do is um, during, um, we'll, we'll, we'll make sure your contact information great. get out for sure. Great. Um, because this service is, is greatly needed um, in a community for sure. And I wanted to just mention that we do provide faith-based services and non-faith-based services. Okay. For those who, because you mentioned a pastor, for those who are Christians or believers and really believe that they need the faith-based services, we want to make sure that people understand that we do have that available. Okay, that's that's mm -hmm. important. Mm -hmm. do, do you think um, a, a family can enable the loved one without even knowing it? Well, they don't usually know it okay. because it's their behavior, whether negative or positive, it's total behavior. That's just how they behave. And a lot of it is driven by guilt and shame. Yeah, yeah. And, and the only reason I ask that is because I, you know, and I have to say this, my mom, I love her, love her dearly. But we, you know, we're, we're, we see things different a lot. And, mm -hmm. you know, I have a brother who is an adult. Um, he is an alcoholic. And, um, you know, I, I try to talk to her and, and let her, you know, know that mom, don't, don't give him money. Don't buy his beer. And so in her opinion, she said, oh, it's just, it's not a big deal. It's just beer. But no, this, I mean, he can't go without drinking. When he don't have beer or alcohol or whatever, he get the shakes. And, and, I, and I try to explain to her, we've went round and round on the phone about this. Um, from my end, respect, I was very respectful about it, and she was too, but, you know, she, she, just, she don't see it. And to me, that's a problem because, you know, he lived at home with her, but if something happened to her, then he, now he's going to have to face the music, so to speak, because you're not, you know, and I tell him all the time, like, man, you need to, you know, get yourself together, you need to get a job, you got a daughter, because if something happened to mother, you can't come stay at my house. Not, and you know, not with that behavior. If you come, you're gonna have to come correct. You know, I'll help you, you know, I'll try to get you treatment, some help and things like that, but you can't come live in my house, not have a job, just drink all day long while I'm at work. It, it don't work like that. But she really, honestly, she don't see nothing wrong with that. Like she really think that she's doing the right thing by him. And I don't know how to convey that to her. Like I really don't. I believe you conveyed it. A lot of people are blind to those relationships. Yeah. For them, it is their norm. It's their familiar. Yeah. The other piece is, I believe that it's very clear that we can't control other people. We yeah. Can't, we can't motivate other people to yeah. do something different, and we can't change their mind. Yeah. It takes, I believe, very skilled, knowledgeable, engaging in a professional setting for that to happen. Yeah. There are excellent certified addiction counselors out there. There are excellent therapists. If they are also uh, trained, have taken the necessary education, are also certified in addiction treatment. Yeah. And doctors, especially ASAM, medical doctors who treat addiction, that can help. Yeah. My problem in the field is that there are a lot of people involved in addiction treatment who are not educated enough or qualified to do the work and they create more harm than help. Mm -hmm. There are also interventionists in the field who have no training and are not cer uh, certified who are out there offering services 
who do more harm than good. Mm -hmm. And I believe it's really important for families to check individuals out, mm -hmm. request their certification, ask for a couple of references before they make decisions to work with anyone in the field, especially situations like you just explained with your mother and brother, because that takes a certain level of expertise yeah. to work with and to be able to realize some progress or some outcome, but unless they're even willing to get the help, nothing's going to change. Yeah, exactly. Right. I took a, um, I took a, um, um, a class or something, um, and it was talking about, the instructor was talking about um, pretty much what you just said that, um, you know, like the family members or friends can want the person to get treatment and, and get off their uh, drug right. of choice, but it has to be the person's decision. It right. has to be the person's decision. And one of the things that, um, I mean, with my friend's family, we were, I, I'm glad I was somewhat educated, not as right. obviously educated as, as you are, but I had some type of education about this. And, um, but I, I was conscious when I would talk to him not to try to really force him, but I was, um, you know, trying to encourage him, just trying to lay out this picture for him um, so he could realize the things that he have and the things that he potentially would have to lose if he continued down this path, you know. And I went with him, I remember going with him um, recently to um, a, a doctor's appointment and um, he, he ended up, uh, after, after him getting his um, MRI, he came out and he just popped something in his mouth and I knew what it was. And so I'm like, okay, well, why did you have to take that? You don't have any headaches, you're doing fine. Like, why, you know, and he just laughed and it was, it was a marijuana um, gummy worm or something. And so, and, I, and after that, I just, you know, I just had a long talk with him on the way home. <laughs> like a very right. Right. you know strong conversation with him and um from that day he you know he started to make efforts and really trying to get off right. the, the 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 pills that he was taking and so um i'm really thankful for that but do you think tough love is needed in situations like this because i've heard of people or family members selling their houses and getting money to put their loved one in treatment and then they just get out right out in two or three days and go back to do, doing the same thing. So how important is tough love in situations like this? It's important including boundaries, but again, a lot of times the family system isn't healthy enough to, to, to even identify or set what I call non-negotiable non boundaries within the family, with each other, or the identified addict. Yeah. I, I, I didn't mean to laugh, but you are quite the little interventionist yourself. Yeah. I, <laughs> I see you really caring, your heart being in the right place. Yeah. But like you said, you can't change that. Mm -hmm. But I laughed like, wow, you really probably messed his high up. I think that was great. Oh, I'm sure I did. <laughs> I'm sure, I, and I'm sure I did that on many occasions, right. you know, because I feel like, you know, when you really, you know, truly love and care about somebody, you know, you, you, you have to really be upfront with them. Absolutely. And, and then for me, I have to create um, ways or be very strategic right. at how I convey the message to them. You know, because I, I can say it this way one day and then it may not work. So I'm, I have to go back to the drawing board and say, hey, okay, this didn't work. Uh, so let me put this out, out right. here, you know, because the truth of the matter is I felt like his family really looked up to him in a sense. Um, he, he, you know, he um, was a very uh, God-fearing man, you know, and he, you know, he, he, he played a big role in his family as far as trying to, you know, pray for them and get them right. to, you know, live right and, 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 and I don't know, I, don't, I hope I'm saying this right, live right according to their belief system, put like that. And so, um, but to see him in that current situation, it, it, was, it was really uh, traumatizing for them and, and me right. as well, because you like I said, I had been knowing this guy since 2008, you know, right. and just to see him in this state, you know, I, I mean, I was like, man, you know, I really didn't know what to do. You know, I, it was times I didn't want to be around. I didn't want to be bothered with him. 
then I started feeling guilty, like, oh, well, what if he do commit suicide? And right. so I always made myself available, phone calls, text messages, whatever, you know. Every time I would be headed to the gym and he said, oh, well, Jay, hey, you know, let's hang out. And I'm like, okay, turn around and head back home, you know, but um, it, it, it was tough. So, you know, I feel like the hard work that I put in is definitely uh, paying off. Good. So, um, like, excuse me, I'd like to revisit tough love. Okay. What you were describing for interventionists is usually called a Johnson model. It's kind of hogtie them and take them into treatment. Yeah. Right. And for some, it works. For many, it doesn't. We don't believe in the Johnson model. We believe in what's called an integrated invitational model that mm. I developed through several different, which is family systemic, which is the invitational model. And it's about an invitation of inviting that addict into a family intervention and everyone giving them what's called a recovery message, which is basically, you know, you, you matter to me, I love you. I don't want you to die from the addiction and everyone giving them that. And then what we call love letters that are read to that interventionist by possibly the spouse, the mother, the father, the sister, uncles, and ex-sponsor, or whomever may join. And it's far more effective because that individual in that moment has a window of opportunity to make a choice to say, I want to live. Mm -hmm. I want to get better. Yeah. And that is probably why we are so successful with the interventions that we um, uh, provide that's, through uh, on-site strategies and gateway uh, interventions. That's, that's awesome. I know, I know you are doing a lot more as well, so let's talk a little bit about the conferences that you oh. are um, doing, because you're doing a lot of conferences all over. Correct. So let's talk a little bit about that. Well, I've been speaking at national conferences for many, many years. And uh, actually, I uh, recently spoke um, on the um, adverse childhood experiences and how it impacts the brain at the uh, Sacramento Watt meeting. Mm -hmm. I am the guest speaker at the Sierra Vista Psychiatric uh, Luncheon. Oh, this wow. Thursday. I am speaking for camp in Auburn mm -hmm. uh, in May. And uh, oh, I'm also the guest speaker for the upcoming Core Connectivity uh, Conference for parents and uh, children um, in Auburn, California wow. in April. Wow. I'm also uh, going to be a speaker for the Admissions and Marketing Symposium, bringing a presentation on ethics oh, wow. in the field of addiction because there are so many things going on the you know the patient brokering paying for patients to be referred yeah. being paid to refer as an intervention everything that shouldn't happen that's happening yeah. including uh, sober livings who get involved with treatment which is outside of their their regulation and even uh, certified addiction counselors who are working outside of their scope of practice. There's just so much going on from the start of the intake admissions and how you market that my hope is through the presentation I would provide that it would get some people back on track relative to being ethical and in integrity. Uh, be, being engaged in the admissions or marketing aspect of addiction treatment. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have a lot going on. Um, one more quick question Correct. that we're about to run out of time. Do you, in your opinion, do you believe once an addict is always an addict? Well, yes, but okay. there's a reprieve. Okay. I mean, relapse is a symptom of addiction. Okay. And if you are doing everything available for self-care and you choose to be around people who don't set off your triggers, who are safe and... You live in a way where you can manage, where you have emotional regulation, and you're just taking care of yourself in your recovery. Mm -hmm. You are not setting yourself up to be shamed and uh, negative experiences, whatever it is that impacts an individual. Yeah, you can celebrate long-term recovery. I was at when I got my 25-year chip. There were women of 30 and 40 years of sobriety that had bottoms worse than mine wow. uh, but again once an addict always an addict but you can always become clean and live an extraordinary life it's mm -hmm. it's about when you get clean what choice are you making 
Your choices may be impaired in the addiction process as you're using, but when you get clean and you move into a place of wellness and you're doing your work and the right professionals are lined up and are advocating and providing you the right treatment um, uh, plan mm -hmm. um, or treatment processes, however you want to look at it, um, you can have a reprieve from that okay. once an addict, always an addict. You're an addict when you're using. Okay. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rodriguez. We've run out of time. I really welcome. appreciate you coming on the show. And that's it uh, for this edition of today's Mental Health Matters. If you enjoyed the show, or if you want to be a guest on the show, or if you want a DVD copy of the show, please dial 916-366-4600. Thank you. When I think of where I've been, the good times and the bad, on a scale of one to ten, either way I'm glad, cause I'm not alone, as I'm reaching for the phone, your voice is there, you really care, you're my comfort zone. Sometimes when I'm lost, crushed beneath the pain, though I can't afford the cost, I just smile and play the game. But there's a healing place where I cannot pretend your smiling face, your heart's embrace heals me again. So even when the storm is strong and I'm deaf to my own cry, I faintly hear a distant song and I simply can't deny that I'm not alone. Ten thousand times I've known my best bet is that first step for hope. Trying to stand tall, I'm haunted by the past. With my back against that wall, one thing is clear at last. The kind of love you show to me flows from an endless stream. With shores so wide it won't subside, my mind had never dreamed. How I'm not alone, even when I'm on my own. Your gentle touch is much too much to let me roll. So even when the storm is strong and I'm deaf to my own cry, I faintly hear a distant song and I simply can't deny how I'm not alone. Ten thousand times I've known my best bet is that first step for hope. Yeah.